a couple of things that I find absolutely fascinating. Uh, these have all appeared recently in the New York Times. One piece by Carl Zimmer is called, uh, which was published on August 14th, it was titled, Our Microbiome May Be Looking Out for Itself. And they talk about how, first of all, over 90% of the DNA in our bodies is not human. It's not us. We are filled with bacteria. We are filled with fungi, fungus, fungi, fungi funguses. We're filled with viruses. And most of them actually should be there. In fact, a lot of the, quote, junk DNA in our genome uh, seems to be associated with things that we have historically interacted with, things that, you know, we've picked up from just completely different species from humans, bacteria and, and helminths and things. So Carl Zimmer points out, our body is home to 100 trillion bacteria and other microbes. This is known as the microbiome. And it's really just the last decade or so that we've been paying attention to this. I mean, we've, we've, we've kind of known that there was bacteria in the gut. They have a picture, in fact, in the New York Times article of Enterococcus faecalis, which is faecalis is a kind of a clue that it has to do with fecal matter, right? Poop. But, uh, and everybody knows acidophilus. Lactobacillus acidophilus, and, you know, this is something that helps us digest lactobacillus, lactic acid, or, or lactose, or excuse me, lacta lactose or lactase, the sugar in, in, in milk. But the, they, they, where they go with this, perhaps our menagerie of germs is also influencing our behavior. <coughs> Ah, oh, they're making me sneeze. They don't like me talking about this. Perhaps our menagerie of germs is also influencing our behavior in order to advance its own evolutionary success. <coughs> Excuse me. See, I'm telling you, the bugs in my, in my body are... <sniffs> Excuse me, giving us cravings for certain foods, for example. Maybe the microbiome is our puppet master. I'm going to sneeze again. <coughs> I missed, the, I missed the sneeze button. I'm sorry I inflicted that on you. Usually I can hit it with my foot. Um, anyhow, we have this elaborate and interdependent, we are like a, an ecosystem, our bodies. I'm going to sneeze again. I don't, this, is, this is amazing. My microbiome is fighting back. This is, they, they use the example of how there's a, uh, a fungus that ants get that causes them to, uh, excuse me, to climb plants, clamp onto the underside of leaves, the fungi then sprout out of the ant's head and send spores showering onto uninfected ants below. How parasites control their hosts, I'm reading from this New York Times piece by Carl Zimmer, is, remains mysterious, but it looks as if they release molecules that directly or indirectly can influence their brains. Okay. They go on to point out It's uh, my microbiome is really unhappy that I'm talking about this stuff. I'm not supposed to talk about the real secret. This is like when I talk about pigeons. The other day, I've been talking about pigeons on the air. I'm walking through Union Station, which I used to take the train to go home. And I've got my phone in my hand. And a pigeon comes out of the sky. I'm 10 feet away from the subway. A pigeon comes out of the sky and tries to grab my phone, knocks it out of my hand. It goes flying out of my hand. The wire to my ear pulls out of it. The battery on the outside falls. So it's now in three pieces on the concrete. I bend over to pick it up, and another pigeon hits me. It's like, really? What's going on with this? Well, I've been warning people that pigeons are actually robots in the planet Xenu, sent here to spy on us, and there you go. So anyhow, how, but back to our microbiome. He points out that these bacteria, well, here, I, I, again, I'll, I'll, I'll quote from this article by Carl Zimmer. He says, 
in our guts, bacteria make some of the same chemicals that our neurons use to communicate with each other, such as dopamine and serotonin. They can deliver these molecules to the dense web of nerve endings that line the GI tract. In other words, they are the, the bacteria in our gut alters our behavior. There may be, you know, and, and he goes on to speculate that food cravings, the amount of food that we eat, the amount of food that we want, may be simply a function of our gut bacteria. And there's a fair amount of science now that's backing that up, that, that people who are morbidly obese uh, have a bacterial profile in their gut, which is different from people who are thin. And the, the question is the, the kind of mid-range, you know, is, is this bacterial or is it, you know, what are the influences here? And, that, and there's some speculation that fungi in the gut may relate to sugar cravings that may tie into alcoholism because alcohol converts into sugar really, really rapidly in the liver. And a good chunk of the alcohol high is actually a sugar high. And uh, a lot of alcoholics are really sugar junkies as well. And is that the result of this fungi, uh, the yeast, basically, uh, that uses that sugar, that needs that sugar? And so it sends out signals, you know, uh, neuronal or singles, uh, neurochemical signals to the nervous system saying, you know, more sugar, to quote the, the fire sign theater. So whether it's an alcoholic or whether it's somebody who's just constantly chowing down uh, you know, candy bars. And in fact, they use the example of chocolate in here. Uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, different species of microbes thrive on different kinds of food. And if they can prompt us to eat more of the food they depend on, they can multiply. And take, he says, take chocolate. Many people crave it fiercely, but it isn't an essential nutrient. See, we used to think that food cravings, if, if you're craving potatoes, it must mean you need some micronutrient that's in potatoes. Well, maybe not. Maybe you've got a bug in you that needs the potatoes. And in fact, they found certain kinds of bacteria that thrive on chocolate that apparently make us want to eat it. So that's step one. Okay. Step two, I want to get to autism. Actually, I only have a minute and a half left. So I, well, I'll start this and then we'll pick it up in five minutes. Pam Bullock, Bellock wrote a piece for the New York Times, August 21st, 2014, titled, Study Finds That Brains with Autism Fail to Trim synaps Synapses as They Develop. They, in my opinion, they buried the lead on the third page of this article. And I will get to that when I, when I pick this up on the other side of the break that's coming up. But here's what they're saying in essence. Uh, the, actually, here's the part that they're not saying in in my book, The Edison Gene, and in numerous other books about brain development, you learn about what are called the three great demyelinations. There's really four of them, but the three great ones. They're around the age of, around birth, just shortly after birth, around the age of uh, two or three, around the age of seven, around puberty, there are, there's a, there are chemicals released by the body that actually dissolve parts of the brain. They dissolve myelin, which is a protective coating around the nerves in the brain, and cause parts of the brain to be dissolved away into the bloodstream and excreted as urine. And so our brain gets smaller as we get older, or the, the number of neurons um, actually diminishes. And it's like sculpting. It's like taking that block of concrete and, and bringing uh, you know, the, the character out of it by da Vinci, that kind of thing. And it makes the brain more efficient. I'll pick this up in five minutes. This is the Tom Hartman Program. And where I'm going with this is an alternative theory of what might be causing not just autism, but a whole spectrum of diseases that we're being plagued by now. So... Brains have to be reduced in size in terms of the total number of neurons from birth until uh, around 24, 25 years old of age. And, it ha and there's a couple of different times, these are called neurodevelopmental stages, where a chemical is released, it's called a demyelinating agent, chemical is released by the body 
that dissolves the, the protective coating around nerve cells in the brain and causes those nerve cells to dissolve. And this is why, and, and, and the purpose is to make the brain more efficient. Fewer brain cells, less power needed, um, and, by, and the theory is that by the, by the age of 7, by the age of 12, by the age of 21, by the age of 2, you've learned certain necessary skills, and every time you practice something, every time you do something that you have learned, that neural pathway gets more heavily myelinated. In other words, more myelin, more protective coating, more insulation is put on those nerve cells. So when the demyelinating agent drops into the brain, it wipes out nerve cells that basically haven't been used, but it leaves intact the ones that have been used. So the brain becomes more efficient. This is why there's a massive demyelination around the age of seven. And if you think back to, if you have any memories before the age of seven, uh, they tend to be I'm forgetting the guy's name who wrote The Magical Child. He wrote The Crack in the Cosmic Gig. I, I wrote the introduction for it. Um, anyway, uh, the, uh, the Magical Child. You, you think back to life before the age of seven, and, and the world seemed like a magical place. And it lost its magic after the age of seven. So typically, kids don't believe in Santa Claus after they're seven years old, for example. But they're perfectly willing to believe it before that, because the world is a magical place. Well, there's this demyelination that happens around seven, and big chunks of the brain go away. And this is why if a child learns a second language before the age of seven, or learns music and acquires perfect pitch before the age of seven, they will speak that language as if they were a native speaker. Even though it's a second or third language for them, they will speak it as if they were a native speaker their entire life. On the other hand, if you learn a language after the age of seven, no one will ever think you're a native speaker. You will never, ever lose your accent. Because when you learn a language before the age of seven, you learn it in what's called Broca's region. It's the left parietal, the left side, right above the ear of the brain. But after that demyelination, a lot of those nerves in Broca's region are gone. And the only place there's extra computing horsepower left over is back in the occipital region, the back part of the brain, where we process vision. And so, that, so we learn second and third languages after the age of seven, mostly in the visual region, which is why you, you, you learn things like, oh, if you want to say, uh, excuse me in Japanese, it's dotashimashite. So imagine somebody saying, don't touch my mustache, and a guy twirling his mustache. If you think of that picture, dotashimashite, that's how you can remember the word, right? So this is why, you know, after the age of seven, we learn tricks to learn. Before the age of seven, we just natively learn it. Okay, so this demyelination is really important. And apparently what happens with autism is that the demyelination doesn't happen. So people with autism end up with too many synapses. In fact, the headline of Pam Bullock's piece is, Study Finds that Brains with Autism Fail to Trim Synapses as They Develop. Now, here's where I said they, they buried the lead. And this is what I think is amazing. There's a, a protein called mTOR. Uh, TOR means target of ra rabamycin. Rabamycin is an immunosuppressant drug. Ram rap rapamycin, excuse me. It's an immunosuppressant drug that they use for things like to give people who have kidney transplants, for example, so the body doesn't reject the organ. It suppresses the immune system. And these TOR pathways, these mTOR pathways, represent an elevation of activity of the immune system. And so they're, they're saying in the mice, a key protein called mTOR was hyperactive, which impaired the brain's ability to clear out unnecessary synapses. By giving the mice the drug rapamycin, the scientists were able to reduce mTOR's activity, fixing the process of pruning synapses. So in other words, the immune system is out of, out of balance, out of whack. Now here's the thing that we know about worms, parasites. Most people over the age of 40, at some point in their lives, in the United States, have had worms. The most common one is pinworms. Used to be, pinworms used to run rampant throughout our school systems, in our daycare centers. They were everywhere. Anybody who's over 40 probably has a memory of having had pinworms. Um, possibly hookworms and possibly whipworms. None of these worms in small quantities cause any problems or symptoms other than uh, pinworms would cause a little bit of itchy, itchy butt syndrome, but that's it. 
But what these worms do is they produce proteins that downregulate our immune system so that we don't reject them. We co-evolved with these worms. These proteins go into our bloodstream, into our body, and they reduce the activity overall of our immune system. They reduce these mTOR pathways. Since the 80s and 90s, we've had whole new classes of antibiotics that are not only antimicrobial, but they're anti-helminthic. In other words, they don't just kill bacteria, they kill worms. We have wormed ourselves. And I think that might be something that's causing autism. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Call 866-987-THOM. This is a variation on the hygiene hypothesis, which you can easily Google. And check, and if you want to Google this and learn more, look at helminthic therapy. These worms are called helminths.